Okay, thanks for uh, coming here this late, uh, this late part of the day. I realize uh, most of you are in your mind maybe already going home. So, uh, but this is a great opportunity for us to, to tell you more about how to auto-generate a backend in minutes. So I'm Per, this is Emil. Yeah. So um, we all here are probably developers of some kind, no matter if it's a front-end developer or a back-end developer or a full-stack developer. Uh, but there's one thing all developers have in common, and that's we constantly have to make these trade-offs. Uh, we have to consider, you know, how feature complete our application is going to be, considering the time we have to implement it. We're going to have to consider how fast it can execute towards how much time we have to actually optimize it. So we're constantly doing all these kinds of uh, considerations when we uh, are building applications. Um, so here is one thing I'm going to pro propose to you. Isn't the best thing not having to write any code at all? Um, we're going to talk about code generation as a method to increase the product, uh, productivity of developers. Um, so there are sort of multiple things that come with code generation. For example, um, you can write your code very efficiently and short, be done in a very short period of time. Uh, you can apply modifications easily and then apply them everywhere throughout your code base. You can minimize the amount of errors you do in your code by uh, writing the thing good one time and then multiplying it for multiple uh, cases. And you can maximize the, uh, the performance of your tests by actually being able to run the same test in multiple environments. So uh, we're going to talk about the don't repeat yourself principle uh, as an opposite to wet, we enjoy typing, uh, and how to code your code. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm Per. Uh, I founded like three or four IT companies before. Let me Palo Alto in California. Been uh, doing a lot of Java lately, the late decades. I was around when the first version of Java came and I've been stuck with it since then. Still struggling. Made some inventions and I have a big blog for Java uh, uh, users or programmers. And I think Emily and I together have kind of one million uh, hits on our blogs. Mm -hmm. That's good. You. Yeah. And you can present yourself. Yeah, so <laughs> my name is Emil Forsland, and I'm a backend developer. And now you're probably wondering why uh, we're talking about backend stuff at the Centra conference. So we're going to get to that too in a few moments. But I also live in Palo Alto since about uh, 40 months, uh, and uh, have about eight years of Java experience, and uh, have my own blog called Age of Java that has uh, several thousand hits each, each week. So yeah, that's, that's our speakers. That's us. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Let's go on, what's Xpeeder? You guys know a lot of front-end programming, and we thought that, wow, it's a cool front-end, mm -hmm. but why not make a, an automatic back-end so you can make a one-end, so to speak. You can work with everything. Uh, and you don't have to know so much about Java or back-end programming or SQL databases or whatever there is, because everything, as Emil will show, will be automatic. So you have a bunch of databases here, maybe one or two or, or many. And then use Xpeeder just magically fixes everything, and then you can focus on your front end. So that's that's the objective of Xpeeder. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So this is the scenario: you have an XJS application, and then you have Xpeeder, which you you to configure it to run. Uh, and you have an existing relational database, so you already have data or already have a data structure. And there is a tool that you can use to connect to your database. It uses this tool. Just click around, and select the settings you want, and then you just push the generate button, and there's your application. Very simple. And this application, you can run it directly from your IDE, and you can also deploy it in an enterprise-grade uh, server, like a Java EE application server. I know some of you uh, haven't worked with Java before, but that's not really uh, so important here, because there are already Java EE app, uh, servers that you can use out of the box, so it's not uh, complicated to use them. Uh, and also, uh, over time, your database will change, and then maybe the structure of your data will be changed. So in the tool, you can also very easily merge those changes into your existing application. Maybe you add columns or drop tables or whatever you do. So this is the APA management uh, tool that you see on the right-hand side. There is a list of columns and, and, and tables and schemas here. And on the right-hand side, you can do settings like typing in your own uh, REST endpoint or whatever, disabling columns that you might not want to show. So you can exi def define exactly what kind of data you want to see. Maybe you want to take out the password uh, 
field and uh, stuff like that. Maybe you have an application that only exposes a part of a certain table. Uh, you can rename tables because then maybe they have a meaning in the database, but you will, would like to assign them another logical meaning, so you can call them something else. Uh, you can create custom HTTP paths because of your application might want to reside in, in one path. Uh, you, you get a default path that is, you know, uh, the schema slash the table, and there you are, but you might want to have another, so you can configure that. You can change the format of your data. Maybe you have a date format, but you want to use uh, epic seconds or something else, then you can do that. And you can create virtual columns because your column or your table might not mm, have the exact date, the data you want to show. Maybe you have foreign keys, you have a normalized database and foreign keys to stuff you want to show. And then you can create virtual columns, which exactly which behaves like a, a, a normal column, but really under your control. So, and when you generate a done time, you will have a, a, a REST uh, interface. So you can kind of do this with the command line. You, you start hit by 1,000, you limit by 25, and then you have this callback, and then you get this. It's very simple. It's very standard uh, grid behavior. Okay, another cool feature is that everything is pulled into memory. So the response times are really uh, uh, good. Like you have latencies in the milliseconds. Well, you can imagine if you have a big, big uh, table with like 100 millions of rows, and you have a database, and you scroll to the middle, and then you have to wait like 10 or 20 seconds. But with Expedia, you, you only want to wait like 10 milliseconds. So it, it's a big difference when you use with big data and large tables. And over time, your database content change, so, so Expedia will reload that automatically for you. Uh, you will have a multi-threaded execution, so if you have a big server with many threads, uh, they will all be used. And uh, automatic JSON encoding, you can use SSL for uh, if you want to have secure connections. And, oh, oops, that was two clicks. And if you deploy it in a Java EE server, you can utilize all the security and everything that's uh, already present there. So you don't have to do that yourself. This shows with the workflow. So you have a database, you use this tool I just described, then you generate code, and most, in most times you don't have to worry about the code, you don't have to change it, but you can change it, but you don't, usually you don't have. And then you deploy it, and you try it, and you figure out that maybe I want to change something, so you can go back again and iterate. So this is the typical workflow. Work in the tool, generate code, and then deploy and test. And the cool thing is that you can do everything, all the steps in your development IDE. So you don't have to switch between programs. You can just remain in your IDE, and that gives you a very rapid development cycle. Yes, so I'm going to talk about a uh, kind of example case to let you see a little bit how we work in this. So um, imagine that we have an organization, a sales organization, and they have a database consisting of multiple tables. Uh, we have um, something that originates in like a sale table. And every sale is associated with a salesperson. They, it's a certain product that was sold. It was sold to a certain customer. And those customers are associated with a country that's part of a region. And the salesperson work at a certain office that's part of a country and a region and so on. So this is a kind of a typical database. It's very normalized, easy. Your DBA will love this. Uh, but it's not necessarily what you want to show in a, a grid out of the box. So you have to do some kind of modifications on this. Uh, this also continues, uh, consists of millions of rows. So we have a lot of data and you, don't, you can't possibly show all in a simple standard grid. You have to use some kind of buffer store. So this is what we want to create. We want to create a Sencha buffer store where you can infinitely scroll in all these millions of rows and uh, sort them, filter them in real time and do thing, these kind of things. And normally, you would have to you know, get one of your backend developers, or if you are a full stack developer, sit down and kind of write this and, and deserialize all the, the filters that are sent by Sencha, and you will have to translate them into SQL and probably do some kind of caching yourself to prevent the queries from taking forever. Uh, so that's a lot of time that you, you put into that. And I mean, you're here at SencheCon. You're here to write front end uh, applications. You don't want to spend a lot of time just setting up a backend. So uh, we're going to show how you can get all this automatically. So how to get there? We're going to launch Xpeeder. We're going to connect to this database running local on my machine. 
then we're going to create a API endpoint, a REST endpoint for the uh, customer table. Then we're going to create a virtual column to the region table so that we can include information from another table into that. And then we're going to generate code and run. And I'm going to do this, I mean, uh, in a few iterations so that you can see how you can actually iterate upon the, uh, uh, the backside. So uh, the goal of this little uh, example is to get this. Get an API that we can query using REST uh, that re returns responses exactly as Sentra wants them. So you can just plug them right into your buffer store and get a nicely labeled, nicely optimized queries immediately. So uh, yeah, secure uh, SSL comes out of the box. We get the results formatted as JSMP and uh, we can use virtual columns to kind of include data from multiple tables. Um, so how fast is this? Do we lose any performance on generating code instead of writing it ourselves? The answer is no, actually it goes faster. Because uh, XPD builds upon a technology uh, developed by us at Speedmont that involves in-memory acceleration and caching that makes it possible to actually resolve queries faster than if you were to uh, run directly towards the database. Uh, in many cases we get a latency below 10 milliseconds. Uh, you can run tens of thousands of transactions per second. Uh, the implementation time of this is regularly about five minutes. So, compared towards a traditional backend development process, you would first, you know, model the database, kind of, you know, in, in Hibernate or in some other kind of uh, modeling language to kind of get objects instead of uh, SQL queries. You would probably have to, you know, set up your, um, your SSL to get a secure connection towards your, your center front end. Uh, you would have to do the, the parsing of the commands. Uh, I've seen how Sensha sends uh, REST commands, and you know, there's a lot of you know, handling the filters, separating them up into uh, different objects, and, and generating SQL from them. So it's a, it's a little bit of a process, it can take an hour. You have to deserialize the parameters, uh, manage database connections, make sure that you're pooling them correctly so you not waste all the resources from the database. You have to, to actually generate the SQL code to send. You'll have to optimize the queries so that you don't you know, overflow the database with the same query over and over again. You will have to parse the database response that is sent back to you. You will have to format it into JSON and you'll have to send it back to the client. Uh, write XML configs for setting up the servlets, deploy it in Java EE or some other application service and you know, these things add up. It's a lot of time and it's completely unnecessary. It's, you know, you have your database, you already have a normalized structure for your data, and you have your front-end app that you want to put time into develop and polish. Why do you have to do all these things that are in the middle? Instead, we have the Expeder back in development process, where you just connect to the database, select the tables and columns you actually want to expose, press generate, deploy it, run it. Didn't that sound much easier? So now I'm going to show you live. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry. Whoops. <laughs> nice catch. So this is how the graphical tool looks like for the beginning. First, the first time you start it, uh, you obviously have to you know, point it to your database, give the IP address, port, whatever, and you have to uh, give your credentials to be able to connect to the database and your schema. And then you just press connect, and there you, the tool is. It will extract everything from the database automatically. Uh, and most of the cases, you just set a file, you just press generate, and you can start using it. Uh, but if this is an iteration, you can press the other one, call reload, and then you can merge the changes of the database with your ex existing model. So if you added a, a column, for example, that new column will be available. Uh, you have a structured uh, uh, tree here with all the components, all the elements, like foreign keys. Uh, indexes, columns, tables, uh, whatever that's in the database. And uh, uh, yeah. And you can control, if you click on one object here, like a table, then you get up all the settings for the table here. Like here I have a uh, mark the, the product as such, and then you can make modifications to that. And you get feedback, so when you play with it, you get feedback uh, on the right hand side. We can have uh, status dialogues popping up and it's totally integrated with the Azure IDE. So you don't have to download Xpeeder. You just mention it as a, as a plugin, and it will automatically be included in your environment. So you just paste in a few lines, and, and the tools are available to you. And the tools are not shipped to the, to the application that results. The, the tool is only used when you program, and you will have this smaller, efficient uh, application that's been generated. So it supports IDE, 
Uh, those ideas you see there, NetBeans, Eclipse, and IntelliJ. Uh, yeah, this is what I told you, so I'll skip that. And we support uh, the open source, the big open source databases and Oracle. And we also support um, virtually all other databases uh, in customer projects. So if you, look, if you work with uh, Microsoft SQL or uh, any other database, just contact us and we will fix it. Uh, you can deploy it in, an, in a huge number of uh, uh, enterprise servers, like uh, WebLogic, Oracle, Tom, Tom, Tom E, Pariah, JBoss, or, or any other open source version uh, that's there. And all, you can also run it standalone, so you don't have to deploy it in, a, in an enterprise grade. You can just deploy it directly in the IDE. When it comes to AXTJS, we support all of them, you know, Current, I would say, version. Uh, I guess all of you are within this range. Uh, or anyone using XJS3 here? No. You are? Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Maybe we can, <laughs> we can have a look at that too. Uh, I don't know. But they will use, you just use a buffer store for 6 and 5, and for 4 you use a regular store, but just set buffer equals true. And everything will work automatically. So. Yes, so now I'm going to switch over to my computer and I'm going to show you how to do it. And hopefully the uh, demo gods are with us. So yeah, here I have my operating system and now I want to create a new product with Speedman. Experience. So I go to uh, our website, select that I want to uh, know about the user guide. And I'm just going to skip over this because what we really need is uh, something called a product definition. But amongst Java developers, it's common that you, you use uh, some kind of build tool. And the build tool takes care of you know, downloading dependencies, you can run plugins, you can do various things. Uh, and this is the technology that Xperia is built upon. So we're going to utilize that. And uh, I'm going to mention shortly what it is I'm doing. But since a lot of you are not really that interested in, in backend development, uh, we're going to take Xperia to take care of most of the things. But I'm running MySQL. So I'm just going to copy paste the uh, product definition for MySQL product like this. Go back into my uh, IDE, in this case NetBeans, and just create a new Java product. And now you're thinking, you know, Java, oh, I don't want to mess around with Java, but we're not actually going to write any code. We're just going to set up a project and let Xpeed generate all the sources for us. So I'm going to call it Sensha.com demo and press finish. And then I'm going to copy paste my product definition here so that uh, NetBeans can download the Xpeeder uh, dependencies that we need. So if you're interested in what magic it is I am uh, copy pasting, I'm just shortly going to mention it. We have uh, properties that uh, is setting the, uh, the, the uh, database connector that I'm going to use, MySQL, and the version of Xpeeder we want to use. Then we set up the uh, Speedman Enterprise repositories since this is an enterprise product so that we can get the, the sources from there. Then we tell us to use the Xpeeder plugin so that we can uh, work with this uh, from within NetBeans. And lastly, we set the uh, dependencies for our application, which is just the Xpeeder runtime and the database connector. So right now, if I click on my product, this looks a little bit different in different IDEs, but uh, in NetBeans, I can see down here that I have something called Xpeeder tool. And this is not installed on my computer. This is just downloaded by NetBeans now that, because it senses that I have an Xpeeder plugin here. Um, so I'm just going to double press that to launch it. And here I can select a database. So uh, I have a database running on my local host. So I'm just going to connect to that. And it's called sales info. It was a database you saw previously on the slide. So I connect to it and voila, experience is running. On the left side, I have the various tables. So I can collapse that so that you can see them. And it's exactly the tables you saw on the slide previously. We have the sale table, the product table, customer table, and such. So right now we're just going to, you know, we want to generate and see what we get. So I press generate and it's succeeded. So I can return back to NetBeans, right click here and press run. Select, yeah, I want to use that main class. Okay. So now we're launching our new backend that will serve a complete REST API for that database. Uh, since Xpeeder never stores any credentials and you saw that I logged into my database, uh, we'll have to log in again uh, now when we launch the application. Um, 
if you want to use an application server, uh, you can set this with command line parameters. So you don't have to actually type it. But in this case, I'm just going to write it in the command line. And now it's building the caches of the database that you saw to get the, the high performance. And done. It's up and running. So I'm going to go back to uh, Chrome. And just go to localhost 4567. Uh, and um, yeah, I can see, get some kind of hints to you know, where my, my product is, the path that's been generated for me. And I'm going to show the counter table. Oh, missed the dash or a slash. And uh, since uh, by default it uses JSONP, I will have to set the callback parameters. This is normally done automatically by Sensha if you uh, attach it to a buffered store. But I'm going to say callback equals CB. And it's downloading. And the funny thing here is that uh, it is downloading the entire table because I haven't specified any filters or anything. Uh, so I can see here a table with 246 countries uh, taken from the ISO standard. Sounds great, right? But um, yeah, this is, you know, it was really tiresome to write this entire path, uh, you know, slash sales info, slash db0. Slash. That's not something you would write. That's something generated by a computer. We want to, don't want that. We want to change that. So I'm just going to back, go back into my uh, development tool, go to the counter table here, and I'm going to unpress the auto on the rest path. And now I can write my own path. So I can say that, oh, uh, well, I don't have multiple country tables in a database. I just have one, so I can just call it country. And then generates. Go back to NetBeans. I stop that uh, server from running. Yes, rebuild. And run it. And as soon as it builds the cache, I should be able to see the, uh, uh, the new path. Oh, log in as well. You see my super safe password in my SQL. It's a password. Wow. And it's up. So now if I refresh this, it's going to show a 404 because it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but if I go to slash country, oh, and the callback. I have the table here. So this is how f rapidly you can iterate upon your REST API. You just go back, change some few settings, relaunch it, and done. You have a new API. But we're not quite done here because you see region four, region three, region three, region five. Is that really something you want to show in Essential Grid? I mean, a user has no idea what region five is. You want to write out the name of the region, but that's located in another database table. So now we're going to create a virtual column, as Perrier mentioned earlier. So I go back to my XPeter. Open up country. I can see that I have a foreign key here to another table, uh, the region table. So I'm going to use that to actually get the information about the region. So I take the region and just disable it so I don't get a number as part of my request anymore. And then I'm going to right click on country and set add a new virtual column. I'm going to call this region so that the name of the, uh, the attribute is the same. Then I tell it where it's located, and it's located in the region table. An XPeter automatic can sense what, uh, what data I can access from this table, where it's possible to do a join. So I can't select anything that's impossible to generate. So just select generate uh, region. And then I want to use the, let's see, name or abbreviation. Hmm. Well, I think it's enough to have the abbreviation of a uh, region. It's, I mean, it makes the JSON request a little bit smaller, perhaps easier to send to the client. So I'm going to select the abbreviation. And then I select the path, how to actually join this in. And there's only one option here. So I can press generate, and the same process again. Go back, relaunch the server, and then we should have our new updated REST API. Oh, I need to disable the, if I disable a column, I also need to disable the associated foreign key. Now, it should work. Like this, and then run it. So this is how rapidly you can iterate upon a process. Just you know, make changes, go back, uh, regenerate it, and now we have a new backend. And it's great if you're prototyping a Sensha application because you can get a new backend up and running immediately. 
And if you want to put it into production, then you have the security of SSL and you have the option of exactly controlling what uh, data to show. So after this, and now we can see that the region is now the abbreviation of the region in the world. So let's go back and take a little bit more uh, advanced example. Uh, you saw that it had the sale table that was kind of the road of the entire thing where you can navigate to all the other tables. I want to create a REST API from that. And if I go to the, uh, it's actually running right now, so I can see the default one, uh, but it's going to be quite complicated. Um, so let's go to DB0, sales info, and uh, get some kind of hint from there. Oh. Um, and then sale. And I'm actually going to put a limit here just because there is so much data. And this table consists of over 400,000 rows. So it's, you know, uh, and all of them are quite boring. I can see IDs to different tables because it's a normalized database, but you know, and you see the timestamp here. It's written as uh, formatted using the, the European standard, but that's not necessarily what you want to show in your application. So this is, you know, there's a lot of things here that we, we want to, uh, to fix. So I can go back to my Expedia tool, and I'll minimize country and open up sale. And here I can see the different tables. So first off, I'm going to fix the, the timestamp issue. Since, you know, I don't want to send this as a string because that will make it more difficult for the, the front end to actually format. I want to send it as a pure epic second. So you change the, the mapping here from timestamp to timestamp to timestamp to integer. Basically just sending the raw data. And then I want to uh, create mappings for the different salesperson, customer, product, and uh, yeah, those three. So right click and create a virtual column. I call this salesperson, and it's going to be the salesperson, and we take the name of the salesperson. And then I'm going to create the customer. So we take the customer and the name of the customer. Then we're going to take the name of the product as well. Like that. And then I need to disable the existing ones so that we don't get multiple um, attributes with the same name. So we take the disable the foreign keys this time as well. So, regenerates. We stop the server. And relaunch it. Let's update this. And now we can see that the salesperson has a name, the, there is a customer, there's a product, and the timestamp has been uh, returned as an epic time. So yes. And the API that's been generated is a support for filters, a support for sorting, so all the, the standard functions in the, the grid API uh, exist. So yeah, that's, the, that's for this demo. Cool, so let's talk about performance. So how can it be so, so quick compared to the database? Of course, one explanation is that the data is much closer to the application. Uh, so everything is stored in memory. Uh, and and, and Expeder also retains sorted views of all your data for all columns. So you don't have to, when you press sort on any column, you do, the backend doesn't have to do anything. It already has a view of that sorted. In, in both directions. Uh, it also has a filter lookup. So for example, if you want a filter of all names uh, that are Bob, for example, uh, we don't have to search the entire da database. There is already a lookup for that. So you, it's just one operation to get all Bobs, whether it's one or, or 100,000 Bobs. There is a skip dictionary. So I told you before that it takes usually a long time if you have a database, to, if you scroll to the middle of it. But with this dictionary, you can jump pretty much directly to the right uh, position where you are. So that, that makes the scrolling, if you use the right-hand side scroll bar, very quick. 
And there's also a caching of, uh, of the total numbers because Sencha, the grid components, needs to know uh, how many components there are in total in order to scale the, the, the scroll bar. And that is being cached because, yeah, for example, the sorting doesn't affect the total numbers of, of parameters. So it's only about, about caching the, the filter you have. So if you have applied one filter, then you don't have to calculate the total numbers again, unless you update the database. So how quick is it? Yeah, we took an open database that's just on the net, and it contained 40 million objects concerning US doctors. And we compared it with a, just a, a normal a SQL uh, uh, database query and with XSpeeder. And I'm not going to show this now, but uh, there's a big difference. It took three seconds to scroll, but only like uh, less than 200 milliseconds uh, with XSpeeder. And if you sort, it took almost four seconds here, but uh, pretty much much less than one second for, uh, for XSpeeder. And for filtering, it was almost 10 seconds here. And this was just uh, less than 300 milliseconds. So there is a huge difference, like 28 times faster, 7 times faster, and 38 or whatever. 36. I don't have my glasses. 36, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a big difference. And OK, you know, 40 times faster, that's cool. But the, the, differ the, the important thing is, here is that you go under maybe half a second so that your customers will um, experience your application as interactive. So I think that's, that's important. So you, you want to be well uh, below one second. So yes, I'm quickly going to show you um, something, something a little bit more real, because now you've seen me mess around a little bit in a few minutes. Uh, you see me? Yeah. <laughs> But this is something that actually one of our users built. Uh, this is an application uh, to showcase a portfolio. And uh, you might have seen it uh, uh, over at the main room where we've been showing it uh, for these last few days. Uh, but this is basically uh, built with uh, and backed by an Xpeter server. And it's launched right now on AWS. So you can see how it you know, behaves and looks when uh, you're actually, uh, actually using it. Uh, and I think uh, Anselm at Extremely Heavy Industries that built this, uh, he started out about one and a half week ago and, and finished the entire demo in, in about one week. So it really shows you what kind of you know, productivity you can get when you don't have to mess around with the back and just get all the queries there automatically. So we can also show how um, he combined the same kind of quite easy REST endpoints to create all kinds of amazing visualizations. Uh, so this is all backed by the same REST endpoints. So is this a kind of a bubble economy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is uh, an animation that just shows how uh, uh, you can project different data points in, in various dimensions. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, I think it's, it's a cool way to show what you can, what can you do when you unleash the productivity. So. OK, so the good news, it's free for, to test. So you can download a 30-day trial. Um, just go to xpeeder.com and download your, your personal copy and play around with it. Tell us what you like. And once uh, you decide to use it, there is a license model very similar to Sencha. Same, uh, same kind of uh, uh, way of paying. Uh, yeah. So, and we also have additional features over what's uh, standard on the web. We can do additional database connectors, as I talked about before, if we have you know, uh, DB2 or some other database, MySQL, uh, not MySQL, but Microsoft SQL Server, for example. Maybe you want to update, uh, uh, delete, or create entries in your database. We can do that. Uh, you, might, you might want to connect several databases, if you have a bunch of them. Maybe you have a customer that has a lot of old databases uh, lying around and want to uh, create views over all those databases. Uh, Scale-out solution with multiple nodes for redundancy or increased speed. Reactive web sockets or aggregating operators. Maybe we want to have a pivot grid or something more advanced. So contact sales and we'll set you up. Uh, yeah, and uh, I encourage you to evaluate this session too. Go into the web and tell us, the organizers, uh, what you thought about this. So, here's us, www.xpeter.com. And with that, I open up for, for questions.
Yeah? yeah. It's very easy because uh, you get something that's generated and then you get a kind of a placeholder that you can override. So you, if you know more uh, about your domain model that we can ever extract from the database, you can implement your own methods or behaviors. So it's very easy. And the good thing is that when you regenerate, they will keep everything that you manually changed. Yeah, like the, the things that you change manually will be retained. So you will not lose that portion. So all the sources that we generate by uh, Xpeeder are pure Java sources. And um, we have organized them in a way so that you can actually modify the products that's generated without risking uh, to overwrite your own changes. So you can see that uh, we have created packages called generated. And these are packages where all the, the logic exists. And every class in this package have another class that is kind of a placeholder where you can actually replace uh, the entire functionality of it if there's something you want to customize. So uh, we have chosen to use this kind of layout on it to enable you to actually continue to build upon the solution and integrate with your existing environments uh, if you are an experienced Java developer. Uh, but if you don't want to use that, you can just you know, use the tool out of the box. And you can also use these two uh, approaches together since you can regenerate even if you have done modifications. Hmm? Um, we build a lot upon uh, being able to analyze the database and being able to analyze the structure of the database. And since MongoDB is a very unstructured database, and that's one of the points of it, uh, it is very difficult to, uh, to get the kind of insight that we need to do a, a proper generation. But that said, we can do it as a, a consultancy service uh, if we you know, know how you are using Mongo a little bit more uh, and yeah. do it together with you. We have done Mongo projects before, so we can kind of, you yeah. know, set up the structure of a, a virtual database and use it from there. Mm. So it's possible to use MongoDB. But it, it doesn't exist out of the box. Yes? Can you do more complicated joins, like for the virtual Yeah, you can do joins like uh, X layers. Uh, I think Emil uh, had a, a demo of that, but mm. uh, you know, uh, there's a, a limit of what we can show. But, but if you have like, a, you want to show a country, that country can be from either the salesperson or the customer, for example. So there are two paths you can go. Mm. And in that, I think that in that example, it was like two foreign keys you have to follow. So you can add any number of foreign keys and any depth. And yeah. you can select uh, which kind of path you want to mm. follow if there is a diamond kind of dependency. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We there's a chain of five or six or 100 yeah. foreign keys in theory. In, in the example with the uh, uh, PIQ, I think we have about 10 or 12 tables joined together in the same time. And that's really, really expensive to try and run on SQL, uh, mm. on any kind of SQL server. Uh, but with us, since we do the, the joining actually on the load and not on the query, it means that the performance stays exactly the same for the, for the user. Doesn't so the, the, the joining times. columns will be a first class citizen, so mm. they will have exactly the same speed as a, as a native column. So if you sort on it and it's you know, joined in six layers, it will be instant mm. like that. So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, the, um, when is the data updated from memory? Because someone can kind of try to update it. Very, very good question. The question is, how is the data updated? And, and, and um, you can select uh, what kind of update period you want. So that by default, it's one hour. So it will reload in one hour. And it will you know, have this kind of rolling scheme. So if you are still consuming data from an old version, that version gets to run until it's completed while it's using simultaneously another version that's recently has been loaded. So it can have several versions simultaneously in memory. And some cases you might only want to reload each, each day or something, whereas in other applications you might want to reload substantially more often than, than once an hour. So uh, I showed here how you easily can change the reload settings in case you want to reload more often or more infrequent than this. Yeah, so, so it's, now it's one minute. I can see that without my glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. You can have blobs, mm -hmm. uh, but in the specific case of uh, showing them in a sense grid, it might be, be complicated. And if you have big blobs, they will, of course, consume more memory. And you can easily select on a column level what you actually want to load into memory. So uh, if you, uh, for example, have like big blocks or files and things like that, unless they have to be part of the API, you can actually just disable them and they will never be loaded into memory. But, yeah. Mm. The CRUD operations, like creating, reading, updating, you 
had a slide where you were kind of saying that's a pure services. Yeah, case. exactly. So the, the generated API is a pure read-only API. Uh, if you do changes, you're, you have to do them directly towards the database. So the, the changes will still be caught up by Expeder, uh, but they will have to be done through another API. Uh, so we, we don't claim ownership of the database. You can still update the database from other sources, um, but you can generate endpoints for them. Did that? So, so is there a capability in a tool to generate the CRUD endpoint? No, no that's just an for query. Mm. Yeah, that's so something we'll have to do. Query. Mm. Is that something you're looking to build? Yes. <laughs> there are a lot of things people want, but we uh, we can't promise when when <laughs> we have it. But yeah, yeah, we'll have to see what you know our paying customers are interested in as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's time to go home. Yeah, another qu question. How does it handle mapping of the database table as a composite ID? If a composite uh, primary key? Uh, yeah, um, let's see now. Uh, we know how it works in the latest version, but it hasn't been released yet, so yeah. we have to think about how to do it uh, on out. It depends, yes and no, but yeah. in the new version, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the feature exists in, in the upcoming version uh, of yeah. Xpeeder, uh, but in, in the re released version, I think you have to have a One. single primary keys. Yeah. Uh, but in the upcoming version, uh, combined keys are supported. You can have zero to any number of primary keys yeah. in, the, in the upcoming version. Yeah. Because we're using an internal synthetic uh, primary key there, so we, mm. don't, we don't care about what's in the database. Mm. So, okay. Uh, if there isn't any more questions, we'll have to thank for uh, for listening to us. Yeah, and to uh, yeah, putting up with us at this late time. <laughs> have a safe trip home. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.